It happened a hundred years ago, an event that stained Arkansas but altered the course of American law. It may well have been the worst, deadliest episode of racial violence in the nation's history. To this day, we cannot know for sure how many people were killed, only that the vast majority were black, and that a dozen men who almost certainly would have died were spared only through an heroic and dangerous quest for justice. The Massacre at Elaine, a special edition of Arkansas Week, coming up. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89. Hello again, everyone, and thank you for joining us. The basics are these. On the night of September 29th, 1919, a group of African-American tenant farmers gathered near Elaine in Phillips County to discuss how they could obtain fairness from the landowners. Two white men watching the meeting were shot and one died. Over the next three days, by some estimates, more than 200 black Arkansans were slaughtered in white mob violence. And five whites were killed as well. Federal troops were needed to end the chaos. No whites were arrested, but more than 100 African Americans were accused and a dozen were put on trial for their lives. Because white men have been killed, more black men must die. Hundreds are detained, 67 are sent to prison, and 12 are tried by an all-white jury for the murder of whites. As the trial begins, a mob surrounds the court building, warning the court that if the accused are not sentenced to death, the mob will lynch them. That's an excerpt from a Rockefeller Foundation documentary on what we know as the Elaine Massacre. There's no denying, no erasing what happened in Phillips County a hundred years ago, and only in the past few years has the scope of the horror become evident. To acknowledge what happened at Elaine is anything but the complete accounting the victims and history deserve. Though that work continues, perhaps in small measure over the next half hour. No journalist, no scholar has done, no one has done more to document the events of a century ago than Griff Stockley, attorney, activist, author of a history of the riots and their aftermath. Dr. Brian Mitchell is an assistant professor of history at the University of Arkansas Little Rock, whose specialties include African American history, and who has uncovered some new aspects to the Elaine tragedy. And Dr. Kyle Miller is director of the Delta Cultural Center at Helena, West Helena. He is a descendant of four of the Elaine victims. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. Delighted to be here. Good. Griff, let's start with you. Well, <clears throat> where to begin? Well, I'm gonna pass that to the most uh, accomplished scholar we've got now, and I'll, I'd like to let him give you this background, and then I'll chip in, and maybe Kyle can too, but Brian has done the most recent research uh, available, and uh, I'd, if, if, with your permission, I'd like for him to, to kind of start the story. Permission granted, doctor. Uh, I'd like to begin the story of the uh, Elaine Massacre uh, several years before uh, the massacre itself. To understand what was going on in Elaine, first you have to understand sharecropping and the nature of sharecropping. Sharecropping was instituted to revert uh, the newly in, in, uh, emancipated freedmen back into slavery. And in that system, they were supposed to share uh, a portion of the crops with uh, their landlords. Unfortunately, the landlords often uh, cheated them out of their shares and, and gave them uh, uh, 
very high rates of interest at the plantation stores. This kept them perpetually in debt and unable to leave the plantations. Slavery by another name, in other words. Exactly, exactly. All right. Let's pick up, though, Griff, if I can come back to you. I'm going to let you off the hook so easily. We ought to note that it was the efforts of an African, early African-American attorney in Little Rock, Arkansas, who stepped in and began the long legal process of sparing those 12 yeah. individuals from the and electric chair. And of course, you're talking about Scipio Africanus Jones, who uh, is really one of the most amazing attorneys ever to come out of Arkansas. And he, I don't think he's gotten enough attention or credit for all the work he did and the courage that he showed. But it wasn't just that. He was someone who was uh, not slick, but he, he knew how to work the system. And it was through much of his talent and skill and willingness to even compromise that got us to the point to, uh, where these men could be spared. Would y'all agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Most definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, most definitely. Right. He, he undertook this defense, this case, at, under threat of his life. He did, and I, it's- He was almost, assisted, but I- Right, it, and it is, I, <clears throat> it's important to the story to recognize the other attorneys involved, but at the very end, it seemed like Scipio Jones was, was there in a way that almost no other attorneys uh, would risk their own reputation, risk uh, so much of their uh, goodwill, but he came out smelling like a rose historically. Yeah. Yes, it did. Dr. Miller, just the basic, again, to hit the basics of what happened that night mm -hmm. and in the subsequent days. Well, you know, so, so basically, as, as the story is told, you had tenant farmers who were basically, they were wanting to uh, negotiate for more wages. And they were, ha they were having a meeting at, at the church in Hoopspur, and they were, they were looking for, for fair wages. And uh, while they were having their meeting, that meeting was, was disrupted. And through there, there was crossfire, and that's where you, you had the uh, ensuing of, of violence that began to take place. Their objective was basically a threat to the entire system that prevailed in, a, in the Delta. Absolutely, and Brian, Brian could definitely tell you a lot more about that. But Brian, I think in some of the talks I heard, wasn't cotton at that time like around Thirty dollars per cotton, pound. Cotton was at an all-time high. It wasn't yeah. thirty dollars. Oh, it was not like thirty dollars <laughs> no. per pound. It, it was, it was at an all-time high, yeah. and most of the sharecroppers had been at this type of work their entire lives. They knew what a bale of cotton was. They knew the value of a bale. Um, they were looking forward to handsome shares, but then when they realized that they were not going to be uh, paid according to their negotiations, their previous negotiations they decided to hire an attorney. Uh, what we now know that we didn't when Blood in Their Eyes was first written was that uh, the, sh the planners, uh, the business elite, were all very aware of what was going on. Uh, they had plants and spies within the union, and these plants and spies came back to them with messages and letting them know who exactly was there at the meetings and what was being said. Um, we believe that uh, the police that were outside of the Hoopsburg Church um, quite possibly were there because they were sent there to intimidate uh, the union people into uh, giving up their fight for fair wages. And from that night forward for the next, what, three days. There was absolute, it was a reign of terror yeah. followed. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Most definitely. Uh, I think one of the things that we tend to overlook when we analyze this story is that the, the way people were intimidated was just one of a, a, a whole series of ways we implemented white supremacy. 
I mean, you can't think of this story without realizing that this was just one of the ways. And I, again, with your permission, I'd, I'd, I'd like to just enumerate the uh, way th this has, was done, the way we implemented white supremacy. And I grew up in an era where, you know, my family was part of it. Uh, but uh, as L.C. and his wife, Daisy Bates, knew only too well, white supremacy had been carried out by slavery, bad science, murder, rape, terrorism, lynching, massacres, mass incarceration, peonage, disfranchisement, racial cleansing, arson, racial covenants, predatory lending, loan discrimination, redlining, blockbusting, segregation, intimidation, humiliation, discrimination, denial of free speech, termination from employment, a truly massive theft of financial <clears throat> resources for services lawfully intended for black citizens, quarantine rather than effective treatment of black persons diagnosed with tuberculosis, paternalism, and a civil and criminal justice system that routinely denied African Americans due process and equal protection of the law. <coughs> Uh, as an integral part, <coughs> excuse me, part of impediments to African American rights, the official and unofficial writing of the South's racial past sometimes resembled propaganda rather than history in order to justify the actions of white Southerners. Notwithstanding the carnage and devastation caused by the Civil War, Accounts of the South's struggle and its defeat over time have often been transformed into an occasion for nostalgia, reenactments, and legends rather than attempts to come to terms with its actual history. I'm, I'm curious if y'all agree with that. Hard to disagree with that. Yeah. What, what, what book are you quoting there? Well, uh, this is... <laughs> I'm Sorry teasing. To I'm, te <laughs> pro I'm, I'm to teasing. To promote my, well, I want to tell you, it's my most recent book that came out in 2017. It's Black Boys Burning the 1959 Fire at the Arkansas Negro Boys Industrial School. Uh, but, I mean, all of us are really acquainted. Uh, more intimately than we like to admit with what we have done. If there, if there was a single, maybe a single incident, even with all due respect to the 57 crisis, if there was anything that would, would give the lie to the, what some people have called, what I would call the Margaret Mitchellization of, of, of post-Civil War America, it would be the Elaine episode. Dr. Miller? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I totally, totally will agree with that. Um, you know, even um, uh, e even even coming from the standpoint of, of my family, who I guess some would might would say um, I, I've heard some people refer to us as being more of a affluent or, or wealthy family, but still not, but still being a victim of it as well, uh, because even even in, in those events, um, my great uncles were really were. Uh, totally oblivious to what was going on I I in the events in Elaine on an annual hunting trip and uh, were given the advice as they were coming through Elaine, hey, you probably don't want to go in there. They, they ditched their vehicle and uh, in plans of catching a train, hoping they can get through to Helena and get pulled off the train and are brutally murdered and, and uh, dumped in a ditch. So, yeah, it was just, it's just a, a horrible you know, horrible, horrible event, yeah. Documentation and uh, not merely anecdotal accounts, memories Dr. Mitchell made clear that among the, many among the dead were not even near the church that night right. or were not even actively engaged in the movement. Well, we now know from a number of records, uh, the American Legion Post minutes um, the New Orleans State's item uh, officer by the name of James uh, picking up Ed Ware who had uh, taken flight and was living under an alias in New Orleans uh, identifies that uh, 
most of the men in the Union were captured uh, the morning following the shooting at Hoop Spur. So what occurs after that, the violence that occurs after that. Hoop Spur was that, a little community near, actually near Elaine, right? Right. Okay. What, what occurs after the Hoop Spur shooting uh, has nothing to do with the Union. It is just the community's response to this notion that there is an insurrection or a revolution afoot. It seems almost trite to ask <clears throat> or to pose the question, what, what are the lessons of, of Elaine today? Is, is what hap how is what happened a century ago in East Arkansas applicable to Arkansas today, to America today? It's directly applicable. Uh, first off, um, we're more polarized than I've ever seen the nation in my lifetime, and my mother's still alive in her lifetime. Um, this is a response of fear that the community has. It only took a spark, a little spark of one person saying that this was an insurrection, to not only have neighbors come out and kill neighbors, but have uh, people pour in from other states and have the federal government send troops. Um, right now, it's only gonna take a spark for something to ignite as we approach the election. And one of the lessons that we can learn from this is that calmer minds must always prevail, um, that we must look at ourselves as American citizens first. And, and you know, um, there's been a lot of discussion and debate um, about what's the relevance and, and the significance of a monument, you know, to recognize um, the Elaine massacre because some people say, you know, it, it, it was a violent time in history and we really just need to forget it and forget about it. Um, but monuments are important because they cause us to remember the past. And, and I think it's important to remember so that we don't repeat it. And, and so I think that um, with us moving um, and, ha and having a monument, which we're, we're planning to have the monument op opening on, on Sunday, um, is an important first step because prior to then, as a lot of people in Arkansas know, nobody would even talk about it. And so to go from people in our community not even talking about it to now having a monument, to me is uh, uh, to, to be uh, a pun that's monumental. I think it's monumental. Yeah, the, the, uh, uh, Griffin, everyone, uh, we, I don't want to leave hanging the fate of those 12 men who were eventually spared, mm -hmm. but they were, they were in peril of their lives. Uh, this involved, they were granted relief at one stage or another by a variety of courts, and it went all the way up to Washington, D.C., the nation's highest court. Who wants to pick up the story from that, from the indictment? Well, you're the lawyer. Go ahead. <laughs> People are always saying, well, you're the lawyer. I mean, it's, it's a very complex... Well, you took the bar, Stockley. I mean, <laughs> somehow they said I passed it. I <laughs> No, seriously, it is a complex series of cases that did uh, reach uh, the Supreme Court, and uh, but there was six of the uh, defendants ended up uh, what being released. They divided. Uh, they decided to divide the cases into two groups. Uh, one group was called the Moore Group, and it was led by Frank Moore. Uh, he was one of the leaders in the union, in, in the Farmers Union. The other group was the Ware uh, Group. Uh, the Supreme Court case, would, the one that actually gets to the Supreme Court case and uh, forces the release of the men, is the Moore case. The Moore case gets there. Um, and what is discovered is that these men had been subjected to, to torture to elicit their responses of guilt. And moreover, uh, it was determined that the men could not have gotten a fair trial. Um, the mobs outside of the jail were demanding blood. Many of the members of the American Legion that had participated as part of the posse were on the investigative committee. They had a standing committee within the organization uh, to put pressure on the governor to make sure that these men were executed. 
and the Supreme Court determines that it was impossible for these, these individuals to have received a fair trial. Yeah. What is significant, I think, uh, about th th these cases, when you take them as a whole, is that for the first time, uh, due process yes. was considered to be paramount yes. in the interest uh, of all of us is, and, and that's kind of what we have not, or we've gotten away from, is uh, looking at uh, justice in a broader sense and applying it to uh, what we've done in race relations. So, uh, I mean, it, it, these are of monumental importance. Right. Absolutely. Now, the, the, but I think, Dr. Muncher, you've done some additional research after Elaine, after acquittal, after they were released. Right. You've uncovered some new history. Yes, uh, we do have a public history program at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, and one of the things that we've been trying to get our graduate students to do is engage the community in community-based history. Uh, to do this, what we, one of the projects we sought out to do last fall was to try to write bios for all of these men, figuring out what happened to them after they were released uh, from prison. Most of them went up north. Uh, they escaped Arkansas completely, uh, and we were able to uh, piece together their lives. Many of them worked in Chicago, in St. Louis, in Ohio, and in Kansas, um, most, mostly labor jobs in the city. And uh, many of them uh, are buried uh, around the nation. And we, what our goal has been is to erect markers at the grave sites of all of those men and to uh, make sure that all of them have headstones that identify them and tell the nation about uh, what, what they've done. You used the term, uh, Dr. Mitchell, they a second ago, they escaped Arkansas suggesting that it wasn't merely economic. This was before the great uh, black northern migration, right. industrial migration. It wasn't just economic opportunity that drew them or that prompted them to leave the state. It was physical safety. Well, well scholars are re reassessing that whole narrative. Uh, I know when you and I were growing up, we were always told about the great migration, and we were always told that the great migration was started because of all of the opportunity in the north and in, in the west. But what we're learning as scholars is that um, racial violence, white supremacy, intimidation, all play a significant role in that migration and getting people, uh, forcing people to move out of the Delta. One of the more fascinating uh, artifacts that we found was an article in the Topeka Plains Dealer. Um, and it appears in, 19, in the 1920 Plains Dealer, I believe. Uh, the article notes that 200 indigent people, so that people just picked up and left Phillips County after the, the massacre, and they show up in Topeka, Arkansas, believing because Robert Lee Hill, the founder of the union, was given sanctuary there, that that is an ideal place for them to settle. So imagine leaving penniless, your crops in the ground, nothing but what you can hold and making your way to Topeka and trying to refashion a life for yourself and your family. That decision wasn't an economic decision. That decision was totally based on their fear of what could happen to them in the Delta. Doctor, at the center, how much of this are you documenting? What could a visitor come to your center and see, touch, read, hear? Well, we, we have uh, lots of archives uh, at the Delta Cultural Center dealing with um, dealing with the Elaine Massacre. We, um, <coughs> we're also, along with our sister museum, Mosaics, um, have an exhibit uh, that, that deals with the Elaine Massacre. And we're also in the, in the process of, put, of putting, putting together a larger exhibit that will uh, speak to the massacre. Right, Griff Stockley, we're about out of time, but I'll give you the final word. You can close for your uh, client here. Well, I I think we all ought to recognize how important the work that is being done. And I, I frankly don't think enough attention has been given and, and we're delighted you know, with this show and others to let people know what is, is happening uh, 
in the area of research and the, the kind of work that has been done. I mean, I, uh, I'm optimistic about uh, much of this because of the quality of the work that's being done, and we've got something to be proud of, I think. Griff Stockley, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Miller, thank you very much for being part of our program. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you sir. for watching. We'll see you next week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89.